Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Razia Iqbal. I'm a journalist for the BBC, and it is my enormous pleasure to be here today in conversation with the novelist Khalid Hosseini. This is an event uh, that has been sponsored by uh, a fair few people. Bloomsbury are partners in the Lit in Colour campaign, which is launched by Penguin Random House and the race equality think tank, the Runnymede Trust. And it is all about supporting schools to make the teaching of English more inclusive of writers of colour. It pioneers, uh, the, the Lit in Colour Pioneers pilot now in its second year is supporting 100 schools who have changed their GCSE and or A-level uh, syllabus to Pearson Ed Excel's English Literature Specification, which enables students to study said texts by writers of colour. And Bloomsbury have proudly donated copies of the novel that we're talking about today, A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khalid Hosseini for A-level study to the pioneer schools and are supporting teachers with resources to teach the novel. I'm just going to assume that students are going to enjoy reading this novel because it is a page turner. Khalid Hosseini, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Khalid's novels, uh, three of his novels, have sold more than 50 53, 55 million copies around the world. I mean, this is enviable stuff. <laughs> He's shrugging his shoulders. He doesn't even know. Um, we're going to talk about the novel in some detail, but I want to start, Khalid, because I do think that people are genuinely interested in the life of a writer, what it means to be a writer. And I think students can benefit enormously in just trying to figure out the process of writing, I suppose, um, in as much as writers are willing to give these things away. So, so when you're starting to write something, what is what is your writing process? What do you do? How do you start? I start with an idea or an image. Um, I start with um, um, often, sometimes it's just a sentence. Um, my third novel, um, and the mountains echo began with it with an image of a man walking through a desert with a little uh, wagon with a little girl in it and a boy following so sometimes just an image will get me going um a thousand Splendid sons was really inspired by a trip i took to afghanistan in uh, 2003 where i spoke with a lot of women and i asked them questions about what was going on in afghanistan so that's kind of how that novel began as a um, really investigation into a very pivotal moment in Afghan history and what had happened there. So that's kind of how it started. So just remind us, you were you were born in Kabul and you came to the United States or went to the United States when? Um, no, I was born in Kabul in 1965. I lived through the final few years of the um, Afghan monarchy. I got to leave in 1976. Um, Afghanistan at that time was a republic. There had been a, a, a bloodless coup to overturn the king. We had a republic. We had a president um, who was actually the king's cousin. I was in, Af in uh, Paris in 1978 when the communist coup happened, when the Afghan president was overthrown. And um, I came to the United States in 1980 as a refugee when the United when the, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in uh, late uh, December of 1979. And and all of these events that you have just outlined are are fairly central to the lives and of the characters in A Thousand Splendid Sons, and and we will we will get to that uh, mm. on the on the idea that you start with sometimes a sentence, sometimes a, an image. What happens then? I mean, to what extent do you do you write um, a plot from the from the get go, do, or, or, or are you one of those writers who just for, for whom the story just flows? Uh, uh, the latter, actually. I, I have friends, uh, writer friends, who plot out everything, who have like these massive blueprints on how to write a book, and they have their chapters and they have their scenes all plotted out. Um, they spend most of their time on that. And then the actual writing is just uh, translating those uh, blueprints into actual prose. For me, it works uh, very differently. I, I've never been able to put up a blueprint because once I have built a blueprint, I find that within days I just go off script. 
So um, <laughs> for me, <laughs> for me, it's a matter of just coming up with an idea, um, working on it, and then seeing where it goes. I I literally follow rather um, uh, organically, I suppose. I hate this word, but rather organically, I I, I follow where it goes. Um, so I rarely know what my books are about, where they're going when I begin them. And, and and yet the research for a thousand splendid sons came out of your those conversations with with women when you were speaking to them did you think there is something here i can feel the germ of something yeah when well, uh, l- frankly halfway through the writing of uh, the kite runner which was um finished by june of 2002 in manuscript form i i knew i wanted to write a story about afghan women because that is a story that was really riveting. It's a story that really mattered to me. It's a story that was central to Afghanistan's future. And it's a story that didn't really reveal itself in the kite runner at all. So um, I was very much looking forward to writing that story. I traveled to Afghanistan in March of 2003. I spoke to a lot of people on the streets, uh, in hospitals, uh, in TV stations, um, in at parties and, and and people who had lived through the Soviet war, uh, through the civil war, through the Taliban takeover, and I got to learn in a very personal, intimate way what had actually transpired with Afghan women during these decades, and what I learned um, shocked me in a way that I didn't expect because I had followed the news. I knew what was going on in Afghanistan, but hearing the human perspective, hearing the personal stories, hearing about women who had been widowed, who had five or six children, who um, couldn't support the children and who who struggled on the streets in a burqa to beg for money to support their families, really moved and touched and informed me. And that was sort of the impetus for beginning uh, the writing of a thousand planet sons is an investigation into who is that person behind the burqa walking down the street with five or six children following her that's really what began this this novel this this um inquiry into um the individual stories uh, behind those iconic images of afghan women in burqas and and i and i suppose when you say that it really shocked you of course presumably because it was such a different Afghanistan to the one that was in your memory. Uh, you're absolutely right. In, in the 1970s, I mean, I, I, I feel, frankly, I feel really privileged to have lived in Afghanistan in, a, a, um, at an, in an era where the word Afghanistan conjured very different images. I mean, in the 1970s, especially when I was a, a child there, and in mid 1970s, if you said Afghanistan, people thought of a peaceful, um, rarely known country where people go to uh, w- could go to visit incredible historic sites, um, enjoy the hospitality of the people. Um, uh, it, it came to mean very different things over the years. Afghanistan now is synonymous with war and displacement and um, terrorism and so forth. But it wasn't like that at all. I was I feel so fortunate to have lived through the final years uh, um, of that era when the word Afghanistan conjured very, very many different things. I I have a I'm I'm, I have a very different, uh, different and happy childhood in Afghanistan, which is um, kind of hard to believe because I think it's been a challenge to have a happy childhood in Afghanistan for decades now. And, and, I, and I wonder also about your desire to write the book in order to try and in, insert in the, the media coverage of Afghanistan uh, a humanity that perhaps doesn't always exist, that we are bombarded with statistics and stark images and not always the human story. And, and I wonder to what extent you wanted to write a novel that even if it wasn't the motivation for it, that that may in some way provide a kind of corrective. Oh, I appreciate the latter part because it was never my intention to educate people about Afghanistan, but it was my intention to tell a compelling story. But it was always my hope that in through reading my stories that people would see uh, um, and, and appreciate a different aspect of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has been synonymous with, with um, 
um, extremist bearded guys living in caves and bombing people. Uh, it's been uh, synonymous with um, uh, fields of, 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 of poppy uh, flowers. It's been uh, anonymous with um, terrorism. So what I wanted to do was to present people with a picture of Afghanistan that was radically different, uh, a country with a history and tradition and, 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 and rich culture with people who were complicated and who were surprising and unpredictable, who had um, dreams and hopes and expectations, uh, very much like uh, people in other parts of the world, but very much also formed and shaped by Afghan culture. So that was my intention. The, to what extent I, I succeeded is a different story, but that's certainly my intention. Well, I think in terms of the, the number of people who've read your book, they're certainly compelled by the story. Uh, uh, and and I, we will, of course, explore the detail of it. But I want to stay with this idea of you as, you know, your, your persona as a writer. Do you remember writing this book? Do you remember the kind of the routine that you got into once you knew that this was a story you wanted to tell? Oh, very much, very much. I have the best memories of writing this book. I, I, I'm, an, I'm a morning person. I get up early um, and I write um, during the daytime. Um, I remember writing this book, uh, Thousands of Planet Sons. One of the, one of the conversations that really, um, that really um, sticks out in my mind is uh, my late agent at the time, Elaine Koster, got a Missy Rest in Peace. Um, Elaine and I spoke um, early, um, maybe midway through the writing of this manuscript. And she didn't know what I was writing. And she said, well, what are you writing? What are you working on? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm waking up every day early in the morning and um, I'm writing until two or three in, uh, in the afternoon. And I'm writing this book about Afghan women. And it's told from the viewpoint of, of these two women. And she said, I remember her response was, well, good luck with that. A lot of male writers have tried writing from <laughs> female perspectives, and it's always <laughs> very challenging. Um, but I, I, I really have, um, this book was a, a magical experience to write. I loved writing it. I loved, um, um, despite the fact that it was a difficult and challenging and often painful world to, in, uh, to inhabit. I love living in the world of Mariam and Laila. I love being with those characters on a daily basis uh, and investigating um, in story form issues that have informed and uh, mattered to me personally as a human being, as an Afghan American. So, so th th that's a perfect segue to, to getting us to talk about the, the substance of the story. But before we do, how much did you worry about writing from the perspective of, of girls and, and women? I mean, your agent clearly was nodding to <laughs> the potential pitfalls that, that this might present you with. Oh, I, 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 was, I was incredibly self-conscious about it uh, for quite a long time. And I think in the end, that was really the impediment to a, a rather poor first draft, because I was always worried about um, about well, I'm I'm you know at the time I was like a 30, 40 something year old man, and I'm writing about these two women with, with lives radically different from my own. What right do I have to write this story? What insight do I have to write this? And the way I made my um, the the really the, the the breakthrough for me was to stop thinking about these women in terms of in, in italics, um, you know, Afghan women living through a transformative period of Afghan history, but really thinking about them as human beings that I could connect to, human beings with issues, human beings with hopes um, um, and grievances that I could really relate to. Um, and I thought back on, on, on the women that I met when I was in Afghanistan in 2003 and their hopes and their desires. And, and so over time, Mariam and Laila simply became people to me that I knew. And once I knew who they were as human beings, the gender issue and the fact that I was so radically different from them didn't matter anymore because I knew who they were as human beings. I knew how they would react in any given situation. And once that happened, the writing process became far easier because they sort of took over as it were, as, as precious as that sounds, this sort of took over the, the, the whole process. Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's precious at all. I mean, the, uh, any writer would argue, I guess, that they um, 
the characters speak to them the the people become real in their in their lives and in their mind's eye while they're while they're spending time with them if you like because they are so real in the process of of writing uh, a novel but i i also just want to ask you a little just to push you a bit on you know you use the word what right do i have to write about um these these women and girls i, I mean what what is your view on the scope that a writer has or the it's not even about rights i mean clearly there are arguments inside literature about um how the boundaries that some writers think should be in place and that you should only write out of some sort of authentic experience do you do you have a view on that i mean is it something that you've ever been drawn into it, at having written the, these books one you know that this one of course from the point of view of two young girls as they're growing up in afghanistan no, it's something I think about quite a bit when I when I write. Um, I th and I think it's a legitimate question. I think at the end of the day, you really have to be honest. You have to be authentic. One of the things that really bothered me is I did not want to sound like somebody who had actually lived through those years. It's very important to me to rely on anecdotes, on stories, and on insights that I had gleaned and that I had benefited from from the people who had actually lived through those years. Um, Salman Rushdie said that when the writer in exile writes about his or her own country, it's always through a cracked uh, mirror. Um, and I've lived uh, away from Afghanistan for a long time. So I've always made sure in my, in my discussions around these books for people to understand that I, I, I speak as I write and I speak as, and I feel as um, an African American who lives in exile. Um, I, I left, um, before the Soviet war began. I, I was not there for the civil war. I was not there for the Taliban or the 2001 American intervention. So, um, so that's, that's, I think that's very, that's very important. And it's very important to be honest about that. Um, so I, I've, I've always tried to be rather forthright about what the role of the writing, the writer in exile is. I, I imagine my writing is rather different from a person who's lived uh, through the, um, the the many trials and and tribulations of you know recent afghan history the last 10 20 years some have actually been on the ground and lived there so it's important for me to for people to understand that let's uh, let's start talk about the the let's start with the title of the book a thousand mm -hmm. splendid sons in the book uh, it is the quote comes from a a, a poem um, so, so tell us a little bit about the the poem, and, and then why you chose that as the title, because it is a, a poem that's quoted by one of the characters, the father of of Layla. Yeah, uh, Hakim, the fa uh, Layla's father, loves to quote a poem. A poem was written in the seventeenth century by actually a Persian poet named Saib Tabrizi, who um, um, lived in Kabul uh, for a number of years, um, and. Uh, developed a love affair with the city um, and wrote beautifully about the city. And in, in my mind, writing this book, Kabul was always a character, uh, goes through a major transformation as the book progresses. It goes from a rather progressive, um, somewhat liberal by, you know, by, by Afghan standards, um, a cosmopolitan city to a place where uh, women are shot in, in stadiums and people are, 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 are hanged in public places. So Kabul itself is, is very much a, a character. And so when I ran in across this poem by Saeb Tabrizi about the beauty of Kabul, I thought there was no better, um, no better way to, um, to really capture um, in a global way what this book was. Um, than by this this beautiful line about um, about a, 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 a you know a, a, the thousands of planet sons that, be, that hide behind the walls of Kabul. Um, I, I, I must admit that that being born in Kabul, being born, uh, being raised in Kabul, the city and I s share a, a very special bond. So um, that title spoke to me um, personally. And in fact, every time I've gone to Afghanistan. And I fly over the country and I'm about to land in Kabul and I see the city before me. I think of that poem and I, and I think about um, my deep connection with the city and everything that's transpired in it, including up to last year, 
<laughs> so in in many ways the, the 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 title is not meant to be taken literally but it is i think a, a very fitting title because I, it comes from a poem that's really a love ode to the city that's that's uh, i think a major character in the book well and i i want to talk about what happened last year which of course is um just more than just over a year now um the taliban came mm -hmm. back into power uh, Taliban Mark II, and we will talk about that because, of course, Taliban Mark I um, is present very much in in this novel. But but I want to stay with this idea of Kabul as as a as a character. How how does that work for you as a writer? You've you've clearly got a very strong, tangible, visceral relationship with this city. How, in your mind's eye, as a writer, were you thinking this has to be an important part of you know, the place where this action takes is as important as the things that happen to the characters. Well, it was crucial because what happened to the characters was in many ways shaped by what happened in the city. Um, one of the things about A Thousand Splendid Sons is people um, reacting, dealing with and adjusting to uh, conditions often very difficult that are imposed on them by forces external to their own lives. And what happened to so many people in Afghanistan, especially women, is that they had to deal with um, um, events and developments that they had very little to do with. So um, the story of what happened to Kabul, what happened to Afghanistan lar uh, on a broader scale, uh, sociopolitically, um, the cycles of war, the political events that shaped the country, the overtake by the Taliban, all of that was absolutely key because th those events exerted transformative forces on the lives of, of Maryam and Laila and, and in many ways informed the personal dramas that played out in their homes. So um, I could not imagine telling, uh, writing this story without writing the story of also what happened in Afghanistan and particularly in Kabul in the mid 1990s. The, the, the novel opens not in Kabul, but in the countryside outside Herat. We, and so we hear Mariam's story My first. Um, My parents' and, hometown and, actually. Right, oh, I didn't know that. Gosh. They were both um, born there. Um, I, I, I feel a very strong affiliation with Herat. I was born and raised in Kabul, but Herat is very special to me. Well, it, I mean, it certainly comes across as this kind of um, almost un, untouchable place for, for Mariam. So tell us, tell us why you decided to open the story in the way that you did. It, it, it's really just the most extraordinarily brutal opening in some ways because it is about this little girl who is told in no uncertain terms by her own mother that she is a harami that she is this illegitimate child who uh, will suffer probably far more than than any other because of that status but she also has this view that women have a terrible lot in, in Afghan society. And she feels very aggrieved and, and, and is a very bitter uh, woman indeed. I mean, did you think that this is how you want people to just immerse themselves in this story immediately, the relationship between the mother and the daughter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, in, in many ways, the uh, Nana, who is uh, Mariam's mother, lays out for Mariam in rather brutal, unforgiving terms, how difficult it is um, to be a woman um, in Afghanistan. And it continues to be difficult. Um, um, you know, the, the, the limited um, perspectives, um, the many um, challenges faced um, in expressing yourself as a human being, both um, socially, individually, politically, um, so in, in, in very unsophisticated and rather brutal terms, she lays that out for Mariam. And for the rest of the novel, Mariam goes through a process of learning all of Nana's lessons in, in, in uh, rather painful personal ways that become all too real for her. And several times through the novel, she thinks back to what her mother told her. And she realizes that in many ways, her mother was right. And and she and, and you know she sort of rues not having listened to her mother, 
her mother comes back in her mind and says, you know, I told you that life for a woman is very difficult in this place. Um, and so, yeah, that novel, it, it, for me, the beginning of the novel is almost fable-like. There's almost something allegorical about it. There's these, this, this mother and their daughter living this very isolated life in a cabin very far from everyone else. And, and, and this girl who's um, almost like a, a blank slate in many ways because she has not been exposed to society, learns the brutal lessons and the painful lessons of what it means um, to be... Um, um, a woman in a in a society that is um, dominated by a stringent and powerful patriarchy, uh, she she and she learns those lessons in a, in a very personal and painful way. You you introduce the idea and the importance of learning very early on in the novel because it's quite clear that Mariam learns, well, she certainly learns how to read the Quran, uh, but she also mm. learns many things from her father, who, although he doesn't claim her and embrace her, he does come to visit her, much to the chagrin of her mother. But, but there is that sense of the importance of expanding one's world that feels quite intentional on your part, I would say. I think it's a universal human impulse to want to explore, to want to learn, to want to um, move beyond the boundaries of your um, personal life. And Mariam is in many ways no different from your average teenager who wants to get out of the house and experience something fun, experience some excitement. I mean, she wants to go to the city and she wants to go and see a movie. She wants to go to the market and she wants to know how people live. But because of her um, social standing, because of the psychology of her mother, because of the um, particular social um, uh, pickle that her father is in, um, um, she is sort of confined to a, um, um, a very limited um, a life. And I, I, one of the really moving parts of the novel for me, even a, as its writer, is Mariam, um, the first time she goes to Herat and she sort of soaks in the sights and the smells and of, of, of the city and she sees many more people than Shiva has before and she sees there's this entire life that exists outside of her existence um, in, in, in the, the, the little hut she occupies with her mother. Um, so those passages for me were really fun to write. And they were also uh, kind, of, kind of bittersweet to write because I could feel Mariam's, um, I, I could feel um, Mariam's sense that the, God, she has missed out so much in life. And that uh, for, uh, unfortunately for her for a very brief time, she gets to, uh, you know, live like other people do in a, in a, um, uh, you know, free of, of 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 the pain and the suffering that eventually will will, will consume her life. She is, uh, of course, condemned to uh, marriage uh, to a very a much older man than than her. When you were in Afghanistan and speaking to women, I mean, how much did you come across that? practice of of underage marriage for for girls well that's something i learned from um anybody on the streets in 2003 that's i mean frankly that's something i knew when i was a child growing up in afghanistan it's not like that practice is new it's been i mean it's been there's there's so much about a thousand Splendid sons and so much about what um the taliban um in, um, ran on and what the Taliban's do, um, uh, ideology is that is in fact rooted in long-standing Afghan tradition and culture. Um, that's been one of the lines of scrimmage in Afghanistan. It's been at the um, one of the, the transformative battles in Afghan history has been what to do with women, how to um, uh, there's there's been this um, conflict between urban centers trying to, um, especially Kabul, trying to um, indoctrinate, I guess is the wrong word, but trying to, uh, to, to propose 
proposals and reforms and laws that are more permissive and more liberating for women and allow for more female autonomy and push back from the conservative areas and push back from the rural areas where patriarchy has ruled for a long time, where women have a very specific and well-defined role in society and are not meant to venture much beyond that. Um, so, um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> it, it does. It does a little, but it does take me to the next question quite um, uh, quite seamlessly, which is that when when we see Mariam first go to um, to Kabul and she's married to Rashid and she sees how the how women. Um, you know, she's very young, she's married, she's responsible for running a home um, for a man who is quite brusque and actually quite brutal, although you don't dwell on on his the fact that there is physical violence um, in that house. Um, that, but she does notice that there are women, particularly the women who uh, for whom her husband makes um, shoes. And, and she, she sees that there are these women who live completely different lives and that they dress differently, they wear nail varnish. And so you, you, re you see this contrast immediately in, in a country that is full of contrasts, if you like. Yeah, and that comes right from my, again, my my childhood, my experience of, of Afghanistan growing up there. Um, Afghanistan has never been monolithic. Uh, living in the, in the 1970s in Afghanistan, if you walk down the street of any, um, any, any, any major thoroughfare in Kabul, you would see the entire spectrum of, of um, female life uh, in Afghanistan. You would see um, women in full burqa, and you would see women who are wearing mini skirts and have a cigarette in their mouth and a nail polish and um and, and they, they go to nightclubs and they go to pizza joints and they you know they, they see foreign films um so there's two two very extremes and that that that's what was really special about afghanistan 1970s and why i feel privileged to have lived in that era is that there was space and there was oxygen for all of those this different incarnations of what it means to be a uh, an Afghan woman to coexist together in a, in a city and in a country, particularly in Kabul and, and and other cities, which now is is becomes rather unthinkable. So in in writing a thousand splendid sons, I wanted to make sure to convey um, the sense that there was a a, a rather a diverse and eclectic. Uh, understanding of what it meant to be an Afghan woman in the 1970s and what we're saying on television now um, with the Taliban back, what we, we saw in the 1990s was not in fact reflective on not all of Afghanistan, but but many places in Afghanistan where women had uh, roles um, and occupied spaces in society that might surprise people who consume their news only based on what has happened in Afghanistan since 2011, 2001. Mm. Um, uh, the, the 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 two characters, the two main characters in the novel, Mariam and Layla, the, their lives are very different until they are brought together. So so let's let's just talk a little bit about the the first of all the difference in their lives. Uh, Layla grows up in a in a family where her father is a teacher and clearly wants her to to learn and and reading is very important um, and she has two brothers who um, have gone to fight for the mujahideen and 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 yet there is there is something it feels to me that you're you are saying something about the commonalities between them too that there are these these even before they're thrown together that they are connected in some way even though their lives are quite different they are i think their i think their lives are um socio-politically very different lai law is an urbanite lai law is very much literate lai law is a sophisticated young woman who has ambitions, whereas Mariam comes from a village. But what I, where I think they are linked is psychologically, because I think both um, characters have holes in their lives. There are, there are um, one is missing a daughter, meaning uh, Mariam, and Laila really is missing a mother, because although her mother loves her and her mother is very much in her life, her mother is consumed by her brothers and her, and and Mariam's, uh, I mean, Laila's really, um, meaningful and um, much closer relationship with, is with her father. So when the two women, um, their paths cross, 
they seem to be complementary to each other because they both seem to fulfill something that was deeply lacking in the other's life, which was, in Lila's case, the presence of a um, of a truly present, loving, dedicated um, mother, which Mariam becomes. And in terms of Mariam, um, who lost so many children through miscarriages, um, Lila becomes um, the daughter and the child that she always wanted. So in, in many ways... Um, that they end up complementing each other and um, that they become such beautifully fitting pieces together is not all that surprising. Did, did, it, did it surprise you that that's the storyline that you had come up with, that you wanted their lives to overlap? I mean, I often wonder whether there is a kind of eureka moment in a writer's head. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there, there are eureka moments aplenty and they're just wonderful to experience. And I, I remember writing A Thousand Planet Sons and there came a point at which um, in, during the writing of the first draft, that moment came when I, when I was writing, I, I knew I was writing this book about um, the struggles and sacrifices and hopes and the toil of Afghan women. But I wasn't quite sure what the arc of the book was really was. And often the answer to those fundamental questions is rather simple and really accessible, but you really have to reach it through a process of trial and error. And, and suddenly one day, I remember probably around early 2007, I realized, oh my goodness, um, it's been before me all this time. What this book really is about is really about um, the not, not just the friendship and the love, but really the mother-daughter a relationship that forms between Mariam and Laila. It seems trite to say it now, but that wasn't foremost on my mind at all when I began writing this story. And it really wasn't until I was well into, I guess, part three of writing this book um, of, of, of Mariam and Laila's life together as, as co-wives to an abusive husband, where, um, where the heart of the book presented itself to me, where the heart of the book is this deep and beautiful and powerful relationship um, between these these two women from vastly different backgrounds, that the, there is something um, so moving about the allegiances that women make, and and I, I I wonder to what extent you have drawn on the stories that you heard when you went to uh, Kabul in in two thousand and three that that women have a way of. Um, the dynamics between women is often very different to the dynamics between men. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I picked up on that in 2003, in 2007, in 2009, 2010. Every time I went to Afghanistan, I, I, I listened to women and I, and I, and I saw uh, how they supported each other. And I heard stories of, of, of how they collectively, um, uh, in small pockets, in groups, in sewing circles, in secret school settings, um, um, where they, um, they they manage to to survive the cycles of war and extremism and an oppression that was inflicted upon them um, by the various regimes in Afghanistan. So, um, um, how women coalesced, how they worked together to survive those years. I mean, I heard stories of. And when I was in, in Kabul um, in 2003 of women joining together at beauty schools, women joining together in sewing circles um, and, 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 and uh, using them as, as sort of fronts to get together, to educate their daughters, to read books, um, to teach their, their children how to read and write, to do all those things that they were forbidden to do by the extremist regimes that were in power. So yeah, very much um, the idea of how women um, work together, and and it's no different than what's going, what's what went on after. I mean, women, Afghan women, working together, fighting together for their voice, for their autonomy, for securing a place in Afghan society, for their rights, um, has it's it's an old story. It's been going on for a long, long time, but in I think in very drastic and very dramatic um, fashion over the last a couple of decades. I, I did feel when I was reading, um, uh, this is the, the second, if not third time I've read this novel, the, the, the moment when um, Leila's father takes uh, Tariq, her boyfriend, not 
you know, her friend, but obviously becomes the father of her child, um, to see the Bamiyan Buddhas. It feels mm. to me like when I was reading it, you know, obviously they don't exist anymore because the Taliban blew them up the first time they were in power. But it, it just felt to me like such an important record in a novel to, to, to remind people that there was this diverse culture that existed in Afghanistan that it was a, continues to be eradicated in some way. Oh, uh, Afghanistan, um, what a beautiful and gorgeous and, and, and eclectic and diverse history it has. Um, so many um, civilizations have left their mark in Afghanistan. It might be one of the most unique places on, on the planet. Um, there have been, um, you know, that one of the reasons um, that I really enjoyed writing this book is not just to write about the characters, but also um, to write about my birthplace um, in a way that honored it, in a way that spoke about its rich past. Um, you alluded to the Buddhas in Bamiyan for um, um, those listening in. Those Buddhas are like 2,000 years old and they had been in Afghanistan um, and they were really a point of pride for so many of us. And it was so personally painful and what an affront to watch the Taliban aim their guns at those gorgeous statues and, and blow them apart. So it, it felt to me unthinkable that I would write a book about Afghanistan, about Afghan history, culture, ancestry, and not point to what has been lost and, and what was there before. And how many people from around the world came to Afghanistan to, to set their eyes on those wonders. Uh, they traveled thousands of miles to see the Buddhas and the rest of Afghanistan and, and how proud that made me as, um, as a native Afghan. So um, it was important for me to include that in the book. It, it, it feels reading the book today, now that the Taliban are, are back in power, it, there is, you know, I read it with such a heavy heart because on one level you can read it and think, well, this, this was something, these characters lived through a period of time that, that ended. The fact that they are back in power and, and life for, for women in particular, but the country as a whole in terms of the humanitarian crisis that it's facing. But for women in particular, it does feel like a, a step back into, in some ways, a kind of more, just a darker history, a much darker history than, than, than Taliban Mark I. I, I wonder how you reflect on, on what's happening to, to your country today. You know, Razia, you and I have spoken before about this, um, but um, frankly, um, and I don't know if I said this to you before, but my, I have always hoped that a thousand Spanish sons uh, would become irrelevant at some point. Um, that this story would become a relic of the past. It would become um, a story about, about a dark era in recent Afghan history that had been overcome, uh, lessons gleaned, and would serve hopefully as a cautionary tale. Um, but the reality is, and to my own chagrin, um, tragically, um, that what's happening in Afghanistan today seems to be a, a cruel and horrible deja vu for, uh, for Afghan women. Um, once again, um, women um, have been banned from attending school beyond sixth grade, um, let alone university. Once again, their freedom of movement has been removed. Once again, their um, access to medical care, access to legal protection has been compromised. Once again, they've been um, uh, barred from um, taking any really meaningful role in Afghan society. Once again, um, they're essentially uh, been relocated to their homes, behind the walls of their of their homes, and so um, it's depressing to me, frankly, that a thousand Spanish sons remains as much a story of 2023 um, as it does a story of 1996, um, and, and and so it 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 makes um, discussing this book for me a a um, 
you know, the complicated experience. I, 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 I wished and I had hoped that we would, be, we would be past this at this point. Yeah, but it's clearly as resonant as it was when it was published for people to, um, to really try and understand what the lot is for, for, for women. I wonder how you even explain it to yourself as somebody who has lived through a very different Afghanistan. Um, how do you explain how this has come about? I don't mean geopolitics. I just mean in terms of the, the, the characteristics of the country that you understand. <clears throat> how is it possible that a group of people can say that it goes against our culture to have women educated when, when they profess to be Muslims and the first word in the Quran is read. The first word in the Quran is ik, which means read. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the really? irony is never lost on me, but but I wonder how you how you explain it to yourself as an Afghan. Well, I think the irony is very much lost on the Taliban. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, it's it's um, it's uh, exasperating because there's nothing in Islam um, that um, condones or let alone prescribes what is going on in Afghanistan today in terms of the stripping of, of female autonomy and women's rights. Uh, at the time, uh, as, as you well know, Razia, when, when the, uh, at the time of the prophet, um, his views on women were, for his time, rather liberal and, and rather permissive. Um, you know, it, there's, um, <clears throat> in, if you look at any society, you can predict, um, the odds of that society thriving or not based on um, how active, how educated, how uh, liberated its women are. And um, what we're witnessing in Afghanistan today is, um, is the ax striking at the tree trunk of Afghanistan's future. Um, Afghanistan doesn't have a viable future without it, its women uh, claiming their place in society without them being able to practice their full and legitimate rights in society to contribute uh, to the rebuilding of this broken down country. Um, so this is, the, this is, I think, the thing about Afghanistan today in 2023 that worries me more than anything, more than the frozen uh, funds, the billions of frozen funds, more than anything, is that you have possibly the most resourceful the most resilient, the most determined and dogged portion um, segment of the country uh, that has been barred from, um, from uh, infusing the country with its energy, its creativity, its, um, its passion, and that's um, Afghan girls and women. Um, the country will soar and thrive with them, and um, it, 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 will, um, it will fail without them. It's, I think it's just simple as that. It, it is really heartening to see women and girls continuing to be resilient, as you say, but they are fighting back in all kinds of very small and in some cases secret ways, which which does at least present us with with the single thing that, that we all need to thrive, which is hope. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, it's been... <clears throat> My hope is found in Afghan character. My hope is found in the millions of young Afghan people who over the last 20 years engaged with the world um, through modern ideas um, like women's rights, like social justice, like climate change, like technology. Um, my hope lies in them. I must admit that I'm very sober through the harsh realities um, facing Afghanistan today. And those hopes uh, face um, difficult obstacles. Um, Afghanistan, the reality is Afghanistan today is a country where millions of people don't know where the next meal will come from, where millions of children are out of school, where millions of people are displaced, a country absolutely rocked by climate change, a series of devastating droughts, a country on the verge of economic collapse, a country who took a very bad beating from COVID. Um, and, and so there are um, um, a myriad challenges 
um, facing this country and those challenges are, are existential. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm grateful to do this program and talk about not just Mariam and Laila and the Thousand Peninsula Sons, but really about Afghanistan, is, is that the world's attention has moved on. The cameras are no longer trained on Kabul. Uh, we've moved on to, you know, Ukraine or, 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 and other regions. Um, but the reality is just because um, the cameras are no longer focused on Afghanistan doesn't mean that things are well. Um, Afghanistan is in an existential crisis. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I want to do and I hope to do is through my work, through my advocacy is to is to get the international world to remember Afghanistan, to remember that there are millions of people who need help, and that there's a humanitarian crisis uh, unfolding in Afghanistan as we speak of displacement, of food shortage. Um, so if, if anything, I hope this uh, conversation, this book um, uh, triggers um, a kind of awareness around what's going on in Afghanistan today. Can I also just go back to the, the, the this particular event where what what we're talking about is I think I might have I'm so sorry I wonder if I've lost everybody whether you'll see me oh no they um, forgive me um, so so you know what you've you've explained so clearly why you've wanted to take part in, in this event and talk about this particular book. But also, I wonder if you'll reflect a little bit more on what it means to you to have this book as, as, as one that is um, on the A-level English syllabus, you know, that, that, that there are going to be students up and down um, this country, at least, who are going to be engaging with the ideas um, and, and, the, and the characters in this novel. Look, I, I, I have never um, purported for my novels to be an exhaustive manifesto on all things Afghan. These are novels. They're created stories around characters that I cared about. And um, so I, I, you know, I encourage your students. I encourage um, everyone who's listening and that are that are interested in the region and in Afghanistan and what is going on to continue to educate themselves um, through other readings, through engagement with um, uh, Afghans in the community and so forth. But I do think that um, fiction um, occupies a special place in connecting bridges, in, in building bridges and connecting people. I, I, I strongly believe that despite our many technological advances, the single best teachers we have of building empathy are books and stories because um, there's to my mind, there's still no better way to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's radically different from you, who has a, a, a life that, um, that looks nothing like yours, uh, through whose eyes you can experience um, uh, parts of, the, of, of, of human existence that might not be available to you. So um, I am proud, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that everyone listening um, is, is going to be engaging with this book and my hope is that through the reading of this book that the students will have a um at least a small sense that the world doesn't begin and end with their reality and and that that the world is a big place and and there's so much going on in it and there are people who are just like you who have the same hopes and dreams as you who want to make friends and have fun and dress well and um, go to school and become educated and find a job who simply are denied those opportunities um, by forces um, that are far bigger than them and uh, that they have nothing to do with um, so you know I, I i think books build empathy and um, to the extent that my books have connected people's hearts and minds, to use a tired phrase, to um, um, to issues in Afghanistan, the people in Afghanistan, I take pride in that. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, when I'm when I'm long gone, uh, that may very well be my lasting legacy. Well, um, I, I I don't want to end on that <laughs> on your lasting legacy, just because I want. It was to a happy ask note. It you. wasn't a sad it note. It is a happy note. No, no, I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't. But I, I want to also ask you whether you have read 
um, anything recently or, or perhaps not recently that you've thought, you know what, this would be an absolutely fantastic book to put on uh, a syllabus, um, either on, in the United States but or, or here in the UK? I mean, are there books that you think that you've read and you think, yeah, this would really, really help um, engender interesting discussion? Has that ever, has that, have you come across a book like that of late? I would recommend reading Exit West. Um, it's a novel. Ah, this about is by Mohsin Hamid. Mohsin Hamid. It's a brilliant book. Um, and I think it's a book that, um, you know, with everything that's going on in the UK with, with issue, with, with Brexit and with, um, um, Migration questions and in immigration. Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I think Exit West is is a brilliant book in the sense that it's it's almost an allegorical book about um, this couple that find themselves in an unnamed country in in a conflict and um, have to flee their homes. And it's um, a beautiful kind of allegorical story about displacement, about um, having to leave your home, about the um, the welcome or the lack thereof you might face when you enter a, a, a foreign place. I, I think it's it's a, a deeply relevant book. Um, and so that's the book that I, I would think of. I think it's, um, it's very much a book of our times and very much a book of European times, given um, uh, sort of the, 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 the complicated um, discussions that are being had across the European continent around, uh, around immigration. So Mohsen Hamid, the Pakistani writer, with his book Exit West, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. It, it, I would endorse that. I think it's an absolutely brilliant novel. Uh, all it remains for me now to do is to thank Khalid Husseini. Thank you so much, Khalid, for making the time uh, for speaking with us about this book. But primarily, really, I want to thank you for writing the books, because in the end, as you say, that's the thing that that really can transform people's lives. However, however much in a small way, it, it is. I genuinely believe that that reading changes people completely, changes people if you allow yourself to stand in someone else's shoes, as you were describing. So, thank you, Khalid Husseini, for the books. Thank you very much. Thank you, Razia. It was an honor to be uh, to be here, and thank you for everyone for listening in. And I hope this is uh, this has inspired you. Thank you so much. Thank you.